We uh, at Yarn Storytelling are really excited to be at GOMA because we were actually supposed to be here doing a show last year at this time. And then for reasons that I'm not sure that you've heard of, we got canceled. So, um, so we're back and we're really excited. We're excited to be a part of the motorcycle show. Um, and Yarn Storytelling is a storytelling event where we feature true stories told live and without notes, except me, by experienced and first-time storytellers alike, established in 19, uh, 1912. Wow. <laughs> We've been around for some time. Um, <laughs> and this is our 110th year. I can't even do math. Um, Yarn has been held in bars, cafes, lounge rooms, theaters around Brisbane, and tonight we're adding art galleries to the list. Very exciting. Uh, so first of all, I want to give uh, Goma, I want everybody here to give Goma a big round of applause for hosting us here tonight. Uh, specifically Shannon and Mi Michaela who've worked very hard to make tonight possible. I also wanted to introduce you guys to the Auslan interpreters. Uh, this is Danielle, and you'll also see Zane, so if you could give them a big round of applause. Thank you. That's fun, I like big round of applause. I love it, that's a good one. Um, okay, so now I get to just talk to you. Um, my name is Jasmine Fairbairn. Uh, I've been a part of Yarn for about four or five years now. I've done a lot of different shows and storytelling and hosting and stuff like that. I'm really proud of everything that Yarn has done. I think it's just a really amazing um, place for everybody to, you know, new storytellers and more experienced storytellers to come together and, and have a great audience like you guys. And I gotta tell you that tonight's lineup is sick. Um, it's amazing. <laughs> it's so good that I'm not going to talk to you for very long. Uh, but I did want you guys to give Grace a big round of applause as well, who is our yarn, yeah. our yarn guru, who has been the one who's put all of her blood, sweat, and tears into these storytellers tonight. I just show up and look fabulous in my shoes. So... I, I did nothing, but um, I'm really excited to be here tonight. Uh, how many people here are, are motorcycle peeps? Like that's your jam. Clap, because it's hard for me to see. Cool, yeah, <laughs> woo! <laughs> okay, and who here is like, oh, this was interesting, but I have never ridden a motorbike before? A few people, that's cool. Yeah, that's great. See, I, I myself uh, don't ride motorbikes, motorcycles, motorbikes. I'm going to get it wrong. But I don't ride them um, because specifically because uh, when I was 18, my dad uh, got a motorbike. And when you are 18 and your parents do something, you definitely don't ever want to do that thing. Uh, it's, it's never cool again, right? Um, and my dad is like super, super keen on motorbikes. It's his passion. He loves it. Um, if you are friends with him on Facebook, you will see that all he does is share Facebook motorbike-themed memes. That's his main hobby. And um, my dad uh, is so in love with motorbikes that he has absolutely trashed four of them. Can anyone beat that? I'm just really curious. Is anybody scrap more than four? You ha how many? Yeah, about four. About four. <laughs> He's like, I can't remember. It was many of them. And wow, and do you have one now, sir? Yeah, 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 I'm building one at the moment. You're building it from scratch. Because you're like, that was what the problem was. <laughs> I hadn't built it. That's great. No, that's amazing. See, this is what I find amazing about motorcycle enthusiasts is like nothing is ever going to stop you, right? Like my dad will never be stopped from riding a motorbike. And it was so great. My, my most favorite cherished moment of my dad on a motorbike um, was I was in a car with my aunt, his sister, my brother, right? And my niece, who was three at the time right? And my dad roars up on his motorbike next to us at the lights. He's like, vroom, vroom. also, I'm from Canada where you can ride your motorbike approximately three days of the year. So, <laughs> so he's dedicated, right? So he's riven like vroom, vroom, right up next to me. And my aunt, she is not approving at all of her brother's motorbike obsession, right? So she turns to me and she goes, hmm, well, there he is. The light turns green and he zooms off and she goes, and there he goes. And from the back seat, my niece goes, off to Neverland. 
It was the best moment of my life because it described perfectly what was happening in that moment, right? And a three-year-old could see it. I loved it. It was the best. Um, okay, so I'm not going to take up any more of your time because you guys have got such a treat. Uh, all these people are just amazing. And I'm going to read out their um, profiles because I can't keep it all in my head because that's how good they are, okay? So tonight you'll be hearing from six storytellers on the theme of the motorcycle in celebration of the current GOMA ex exhibition. Some stories will be about motorcycles, but other storytellers have been a little more imaginative in their interpretation of the theme. You are going to love it. It says so, so it's true. <laughs> okay. So our first speaker is um, Jules Raven. Jules Raven moved to Brisbane from New Zealand in 2009 and has been an advanced care paramedic for the past 21 years. Jules is, in the Queensland, uh, is the Queensland state president of one of the world's most iconic motorcycle clubs, Dykes on Bikes. I saw a lot of you guys. Yeah. I actually wrote, pause for applause, because <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. Uh, she has over 20 years of riding experience. Jules has written some of the world's most iconic rides and events, including Route 66, Cold Kiwi, Sydney Mardi Gras, San Francisco Gay Pride, Pink Ribbon Rides, Death Valley, Philip and a Philip Island. Tonight, she'll be telling us about some of her experience. Please welcome to the stage, Jules Raven. Oh, no, this is where I have to do this because I'm short. <laughs> How are you all? I'm going to expand on what she said in relation to motorcycles, because when she talks about motorcycles, I noticed in the crowd that a lot of you don't ride. So I have to be very clear, and because I'm first, I'm just going to put it out there, right? So there are motorcyclists, and there are commuters. <laughs> and then there are Harley riders. <laughs> <laughs> in the motorcycle world, you typically either ride a motorcycle to commute backwards and forwards to work, you know, to the cafe. You'll typically not go further than maybe 300 k's away from your home. And then there's motorcyclists that are just completely fucking nuts. And they will ride for seven days to get to another motorcycle event, something like MotoGP down on Phillip Island. And then they'll get off their motorbike. They'll camp in a tent for three nights in the freezing cold and the rain. They'll go and watch motorcycles. So not only ridden for three days or four days to get there, but then they'll go and watch people that get paid to ride motorcycles around and around in a track, which is kind of like... Vroom, vroom. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, he's fast. <laughs> right? And then, after you've done that, every night you go and have a drink, <laughs> which turns to 10. And then and sometimes 20. And then you go back to the campground at Phillip Island where everybody's decided it's time to do burnouts. And if you're really smart, you'll end up on the back of one of the bikes that's doing burnouts going, woo! And then you get up in the morning and you have to go and watch motorcycles go round and around on a track again. And then the next day you have to sober up because at some stage you've got to get back on your motorcycle and drive all the way back to Brisbane. And that's a long ride. So that's what a motorcyclist is. And I would like to say that as much as I respect commuters and all the types of motorcycles that are used in those, including Vespers, <laughs> I don't want to spend much time on them. So I'll stick to motorcycling, OK? So I've ridden for about 25 years. I worked it out when I was sitting at home going, how long have I ridden for? One, two, three, four. Worked out about 25 years. And like I was speaking to some of the guys earlier, that's like 109 years in dog years. <laughs> because motorcyclists, you either, you either ride a really, really short period of time and you're really, really stupid and you come off and that's the end of your motorcycling career. And that's when you see motorcycles advertised for like an R1, which is a very, very high-powered sports bike. One elderly owner... And they're not only selling the bike, but they're selling the helmet, the jeans, the boots, the gloves, the everything, and it's not used much. That means, basically, that some bloke, typically a bloke, because women don't tend to do this, but typically a bloke went out, went, oh, I want to buy a big bike. Chicks like big bikes. They buy a big bike, and they ride 100 metres down the highway. They go tits up on it, scare themselves shitless, and go, not going to do it. Not going to do it. I'm going to sell it. Or... 
They get married, have children. As soon as their wife is pregnant, she goes, get rid of that shit, bitch. <laughs> Bike for sale on eBay, cheap, one lady owner. Actually, it's good being a female rider because we can get away with that one lady o rider, one lady owner rider. And I remember selling one of my bikes that I'd stripped down, raced on the track for a season, blowing it up about four times. And then eventually, after the race season, putting it all back together, taking the, the race fairings off, putting the road fairings that had only ridden about 200k on the road, putting it all back together and then selling it one lady owner. <laughs> And some idiot guy turned up and went, you yeah, know, I think I might race it. <laughs> cool. So anyway, I have been, on top of being a motorcyclist for that many years, I'm also the president of a little motorcycle club, which is called Dykes on Bikes. Now, Dykes on Bikes is um, fairly iconic. Even if people don't know that there's a club that exists, they actually do know that there's a thing called Dykes on Bikes. I found that out when I had my bike towed back from Sydney after being at Mardi Gras, where that's a whole other story where I broke my knee and doing a lap dance and <laughs> did a patella, went sideways. And I'm a paramedic, so I know what that means. I just didn't know what it felt like. <laughs> I'll tell you, I used to give a lot of morphine to people who had um, patella dislocations. Now I give them a shit ton. <laughs> so that really did change my practice, rightly or wrongly, changed my practice. But when I <laughs> we <laughs> forgot what I was going to say now. <laughs> but yeah, when I was in Sydney, like you notice, Mardi Gras is a really cool thing. Mardi Gras is an awesome event. Does anybody ever been there? <laughs> Sydney Mardi Gras? Excellent. So Sydney Mardi Gras is this thing where dykes and bikes, luckily enough, um, we get to lead Sydney Mardi Gras. And it's a parade. So Mardi Gras goes for like a month, really, and it's a combination of you know, arts and events and comedy evenings and, you know, music stuff and parties and everything. But at the end of that month, we have a massive uh, parade. It's a street parade that goes down Oxford Street and around. There's normally about 300,000 people come out onto the street to watch it. And it's kind of one of those things that if you've ever lived in Sydney, I think it would be really hard pressed to find anyone that's ever lived in Sydney that did not know what Mardi Gras was. And Dykes on Bikes is a motorcycle club that was formed in 1976 in San Francisco. And we now have chapters all over the world. And we are privileged enough to ride at the beginning of that parade. So we start, we start the ride at the end of the parade route and then we ride down and hype up the crowd. So if you can imagine, you know, 300,000 people people on the sidewalk and you know they shut down the street so the street would normally be about five lanes wide they shut that down and give us two lanes to ride in so there's like 50 or 60 deep of people who are on milk crates and clambering on fences to try and have a look and then you look up in the air and there's just apartment building after apartment building with gay flags flying and you know toilet paper th don't ask me why they throw toilet paper <laughs> seen so many toilet paper bombs in my life I'm just about Hopefully they're clean. Yeah, yeah, that's true. When it rains, it's kind of funny, though, because you see people try and throw it out, and, of course, it gets, you know, it's like... <laughs> and the people in the next apartment go, what the fuck was that? <laughs> but when I went down to Mardi Gras one year and I did dislocate my knee, my motorcycle ended up on the back of a trailer, and when it got to Brisbane, it ended up being transported a few times, and at one of those points, it was on a trailer of a guy who happened to be a tow truck driver. I say that like this because he's actually a Hells Angels member. And he came and picked the bike up, and he said, oh, is this your bike? I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, oh, you ride? No fucking shit. <laughs> yeah, I do. And he goes, oh, oh. And he said, are oh, you in a club? What club? Oh, Dykes on Bikes. And he went, fuck! Is that real? <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> so I was like, yeah, it is. And he goes, holy shit! That's really cool, I've heard of that. And I just didn't know it was real. And I go, yeah, we are. <laughs> but he turned, he, I, because I had a T-shirt on, I think, that had the club emblem on. And he turned me around, he wanted some photos and everything, he got all excited. But it didn't really, like, I thought that was pretty cool because I said to my, who do you ride with? And he said, Hell's Angels. And I took the opportunity to go, ah, I never heard of him. <laughs> 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 Made sure I was in a public setting. 
<laughs> but when, um, as the president of this great club within Queensland, we have members that are from Townsville all the way down to sort of the Gold Coast. Some of them are here tonight. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we have the privilege of going all over the world and riding in different events. And I took a group of girls not too long ago over to uh, San Francisco and we rode Route 66 and rode in San Francisco Pride. But just before we went there, I got a email from a um, TV production company and I thought, oh, that's a bit weird. And they said, oh, look, you know, you're, you're one of the presidents of Dykes on Bikes and we've had a request from a movie director who would like to have you guys in his movie. And I thought, oh, whatever. So it's probably some bloody derelict, you know, cheap budget horror show and they want Dykes on Bikes to ride in and kill someone on a motorbike or something. And then I said, oh, yeah, right, send a message back going, oh, yeah, who, you know, lots of detail. And I came back and I said, oh, look, Clint Eastwood is filming a movie and he's specifically asked for Dykes on Bikes to not only be part of the movie but have your actual members within the movie doing a scene with him. So if you ever have the opportunity to see The Mule, which was Clint Eastwood both starred in and directed, um, we went into talks with uh, their production company and Clint Eastwood himself and our San Francisco team. Um, we are so iconic in the sort of gay and lesbian world that we were so dominant we could actually have him change his script so that it was more predominantly um, accepting to us as to how they portrayed our club. So Dykes on Bikes has a great piece of history all over the world. We are incredibly proud of it. And I'm incredibly proud of being a president. But in my riding career, I previously, being in New Zealand, it's really cold in New Zealand. <laughs> so like here you ride and you guys are, you know, jandals and singlets and shorts. I'm like, what are you doing, you know? I remember going to a yeah, I remember going to a paramedic job not long after I'd arrived here and I went to this guy, God forbid, you know, he's come off his motorbike, he's pretty scratched up, pretty messy, you know, and he's lying on the road, he's going, ah, you know, crying, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, and I'm talking to him giving, him, giving him some pain relief and he's like, fuck, man, what's wrong with my foot? And I felt like saying, I didn't say it just for, <laughs> just for disclosure in case my medical director is looking at me, um, but I felt like saying to him, mate, you're in so much pain because half of your toes are 150 metres up the road where your jandal is. In New Zealand, we have we joke about jandals. Oh, hang on, I'm in Australia, thongs? So we call thong a jandal, just so you know, right? But we joke about having steel cap jandals. You know, like you go out, you have a bit of a party, you fall over, you go, oh, I've got my steel caps on, I'm all good. And I, said to, I felt like saying to this guy, you did not have steel cap jandals on. So the road is now kissing your toes. Like in New Zealand, you just wouldn't do that, A, because it's freezing cold and you have to wear like a hundred layers and you look like a Michelin man and you look like you're an Eskimo walking around on a motorcycle, especially when we go to things like Cold Kiwi, which is an event, which is a motorbike rally that goes up onto like a mountain. So we're, it's not good enough as a motorcyclist to go to a camping ground and have a you know, social picnic, we have to go to somewhere that's freezing cold 24 hours a day, like on the Mount Ruapehu, which is actually, in the, in the winter, it's a ski season, it's a ski hill, and we decide that it's a good idea in the winter to go and do a motorbike rally up there. Motorbike rallies are really male-dominated, so to get a female rider at a motorcycle rally like that is unheard of. I know it's unheard of because the only entertainment they have is strippers <laughs> and drugs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> strippers and drugs, more strippers, more alcohol, fire, and then you ride motorcycles up a vertical hill, which is really weird. But it's fun because you watch all these guys who, not to say that women aren't easily influenced, but men tend to be typically more easily influenced. And when there's a bunch of motorcyclists going, ho, 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 you tend to get, there's always a Harley rider, God forbid, there's always a Harley rider that thinks that they're tough enough, big enough, and their bike is good enough to do the vertical hill ride. So they try riding their Harley from flat ground up a bank, embankment, right? Inevitably, it goes tits up, and the drunk rider comes off their Harley rolls 50 metres backwards, and in the morning they wake up and go, and their mates go, yeah, you did. 
you did. And all the females who ride go, <laughs> yeah, you did. <laughs> you totally did. That's your bike over there. It's a bit crumpled, but I hope you enjoyed the hill ride. And someone shows some photos later. Good work. But women riders are typically pretty different to men. But I remember when I first started riding and I had my mum, or I'd, I'd ridden for a while, and I started doing paramedicine, and my mum said to me, she's like, you know what, Jules? She said, you go to one accident on a motorcycle and you will never, ever ride that bike again. She said, you'll see injuries that you just, it'll just freak you out. And I was like, shit, that's so true. Thought about that for a little bit. And I remember one night shift I was out, and it was pretty early on in our night shift, and I went to this job and lots of blood. I still remember it today, you know, lots of blood, lots of screaming lots of yelling, people really, really distressed or what seemed to be really distressed. And, and I went home and I said, Mum, I said, you know what? I said, I, I don't know about not riding a motorbike, but I am never fucking having a baby, ever. <laughs> so I'll be riding motorbikes for a very, very long time. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Jules Raven, you guys. Keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Is this working? Okay, good. <laughs> oh. oh, you've just described my dad so perfectly, Jules. Um, it's funny because you were talking about uh, how <laughs> uh, they do burnouts and stuff like that. And one of my dad's bikes that got totaled uh, happened on Halloween night in Canada, uh, which is quite chilly. Uh, and he was in the... Um, parking lot of uh, the pub that he had just spent, um, I don't know, approximately six hours in. And, um, and he had his girlfriend on the back of his bike and he was like, yeah, trying to show off for everyone at the pub. So he did an extreme uh, burnout, but um, because his bike was way more powerful than he should ever be allowed to own, uh, it went up in the air and landed on him. <laughs> so <laughs> I was in the hospital that night, and he was on a lot of drugs, which is also his favorite thing. So it, it worked out okay. Um, it's fine. Um, okay, so <laughs> we're learning so much about my dad. Um, He's going to be so happy. <laughs> okay, so uh, anyway, we're going to move on to our next speaker. Our next speaker is Jordan Cadell. Uh, I love Jordan. I think she's amazing. I know you will as well. Uh, Jordan Cadell is a Brisbane-based marriage celebrant. I'm doing that because my fiancé is there. <laughs> so we'll talk to you later, Jordan. And... Um, Brisbane-based marriage celebrant, trivia host, copywriter, and all-round interested person in interesting people, places, and things with more fingers in pies than she has fingers. <laughs> Jordan's community-based curiosity has led her through various industries, including a love-hate affair with hospitality, digital design, and running an organic grocer. Currently manifesting in the form of a fortnightly trivia event at the Menagerie on Tuesday nights. You should check that out. Through a lens of COVID-induced separation anxiety, Jordan reflects on the history of broken bones and relationships in her family tree, reevaluating her family ties and what really ties them together. Please welcome to the stage, Jordan Cadell. Thanks, Jess. Okay. So unlike Jules, I've only been on a motorcycle once in my life, but you can tell that from looking at me. <laughs> I've hardly got the hog in the shop right now. Um, I think I was seven when I was on the motorcycle. I'd been taken out for a ride around my grandparents' suburb. Sort of suburb is a strong word. It's more of a shire, Logan Reserve. Shire made up of large, large properties dedicated to people with really loud hobbies. If you love shooting things, revving things, blowing things up, <laughs> Logan Reserve's lack of neighbours and police stations <laughs> make for easy living. I remember being on the bike and just feeling an immense amount of pressure on my chest and seeing a lot at once and feeling the air get hard and sort of squeeze us forward. And I remember the deafening sound of my subconscious saying, this is not for you. 
I hated it. <laughs> I'm not a thrill seeker by nature. I'm a chill seeker. <laughs> I remember years ago, my old housemate bringing home his skydiving video. And I watched it reluctantly, eyes half open, from the ground, less sort of reclining on the living room floor and more just holding on to it. I feel sick thinking about it right now. <laughs> because I'm afraid of everything, um, my story is about how my brother broke his leg while riding a motorcycle. And he did that when he was living in Townsville. We didn't even know that he liked motorcycles. And that's sort of a bit of a theme with Lachlan. He was living in Townsville. He still does now. He moved there a few years ago when he got a job as a train driver. We didn't know he liked trains. <laughs> Came as a bit of a surprise. <laughs> and he's like that. Because, I mean, years ago, after he graduated school, he moved to Sweden um, for a school exchange. And once he'd left, he sent his best friend over to my parents' house. And she'd grown up in our street. We knew her really well. And he sent Courtney over to talk to my parents um, to make sure that they knew that he was gay. Sort of a door-to-door -door coming out service. <laughs> um, we actually knew that about him. <laughs> the one thing. Um, we quite like that about him. Um, I just wish he told us about the motorcycles. Because <laughs> he broke the leg a year ago. Um, it was the first time out on a bike. And it was right as sort of the COVID situation was ramping up in Queensland. He was really lucky. He went around a corner. He took it too, um, too quickly. I'm sure it was just like a very easy day at work for Jules. Um, <laughs> it wasn't too gory. And he got to the hospital and he had friends with him and everything. He had a really good support network. So what really surprised us was um, when my uncle took it upon himself to fly up and take care of him. I say it surprised us because my uncle kind of isolated himself years ago. Um, he and his wife moved out to Kiminya to get their own loud hobbies-based property. Um, and to, in his words, get away from people. So it was really nice that he did that. I mean, he is a sweet person. I remember years ago um, at my housewarming for the first house that I was in when I moved out of home. And um, he offered to beat someone up for me. <laughs> yeah. It was really random, because I hadn't been talking about anything that required that kind of attention. <laughs> Just in my house with my friends, and <laughs> this, like, six-foot-four, bearded, sort of very tattooed person lent in and went, now, if anyone gives you any trouble, I'll sort them out for you. <laughs> it was sort of sweet. I guess it was like a housewoman gift. <laughs> Would have rathered a plant. Um, I mentioned my uncle's look and aesthetic, um, not because, you know, there's a lot of unfair stereotypes that go with those sort of details. Very wild, goatee, like I said, very tall, very gruff, sort of grunts more than he talks. A lot of tats depicting, like, battlefield scenes and flesh being torn from a skull and other people having a really bad day. <laughs> um, he's, got a big, he's got a big vibe. And if you don't know him, that can come across... Poorly. Um, I think most of us know that like, the harder an exterior, the softer the teddy bear underneath. But if you don't know him, that can be quite confronting. And that's what happened for my brother's housemate. Um, let's call her Anita. Um, I'm not trying to protect her identity, I just do not remember her name. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't very interesting. Um, <laughs> But the poor thing, she was going through all the same anxieties that we were at the time. She was away from her family, she was like 22, and suddenly this like real scary dude comes into her house um, for no apparent reason. And I don't know what he was thinking he would do to help. He doesn't cook, he doesn't clean. <laughs> Maybe he was gonna chain smoke my brother's leg better. <laughs> I don't know, but bless him. And she did try. But after a few days, she just wasn't comfortable with the situation. She communicated that to my brother, who respected it. He communicated that to my uncle, who said, you should go fuck yourself. <laughs> it was a real shame that he reacted that way. And I think that could just be no big thing. But what happened next was that he said, and I no longer want anything to do with you. Which was tough. Because like I said, he'd already kind of moved himself out, which historically has happened a lot in my family. 
he and his wife had hosted Christmas the year before and let everybody know that that was kind of the last family event they wanted to be considered a part of. No need to invite them going forward. So my brother, myself, my grandparents, I think my mum at the time, were the only people he was still talking to. So for him to say, I want nothing to do with you, it's a really big deal. He went back home to Kiminya and I can't really understand that reaction. I understand how hard it must be, that rejection. My uncle's had a really, really painful life. But I can't understand how you could expect your nephew, who's half your age, who has half the number of working legs, <laughs> to stand up for you, to, I don't know, relocate his housemate to make you feel safe, to make you feel comfortable. But I don't think he's really ever felt safe or comfortable. He's had a really hard life. His wife and he couldn't conceive and that's always been a huge burden for them, a really lonely burden. There are whispers in the family of some really bad abuse he went through as a teenager. I think it's a shame when families whisper because it means no one ever really gets heard. And for nine years he served in the army, which caused him a lot of injuries. So organisation that used his body and broke it and spat him out with much compensation or pain relief. I don't think I've mentioned, but he's a huge motorcycle enthusiast. He's a mechanic, so he just knows them inside and out. It's a huge passion for him. It's always given him so much joy, so much relief, and I think so much escapism. My first memory of being on a motorcycle was with my uncle. He put me on the front instead of the back, so I could feel the pressure. He put my hands up on the handlebars so I could feel what it felt like to drive, so I could feel what it felt like to be wild and embrace discomfort and to throw yourself into it, so I could feel what he was feeling. And I think it's one of the last times that anybody did. Thank you. Jordan Cadell, you guys, keep it going. Oh, that was lovely. That was lovely. Thank you, Jordan. Um, yeah, that, that makes me think of my dad. Uh, yeah, we're going to talk a lot about him um, because I've got things to work out, obviously, and you guys are here and I have a microphone, so that's, that's how this works. No, my dad uh, has a good friend that um, your uncle reminds me of. Uh, he's a good friend to my dad, his name is Mike. He's a very, very hard man, very tough, very tough. Motorcycle, like die, ride or die kind of guy, right? To the point where my dad and him were riding through the mountains in Alberta and um, Mike fell off his bike. A truck came out of nowhere, it wasn't Mike's fault. He fell off his bike, broke his shoulder, like the blade? the shoulder blade, and his collarbone uh, as he fell off the bike. And he hopped back on the bike and then drove for another four hours and had a drink at the pub because that's how he rolls. And when my dad, um, when my dad uh, tore his ACL um, because he just sort of put his foot down wrong, uh, on the motorbike as it was stopping. He got it caught in like a little hole and he sort of tore his leg. He was going approximately a kilometer an hour. Mike, my dad's friend, came in and he's a very, he is intimidating. He's a very scary kind of guy. But he came up to me and he said, I've got to tell you, Jasmine, I just don't think bikes are for your dad. And I was like, I agree, Mike. <laughs> I agree 100%, but I'm not the person you should talk to. Because uh, I don't know if you guys caught this from me, but he doesn't listen to me um, in any way. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you very much for telling me about it. Because it made me think of my friend, Mike, who's always been a good friend to us. And will just fall right off his bike, hop right back on and drink a lot. 
So that is the way of his people. And um, so now we're going to move on to the next speaker. Uh, and I want you guys uh, to give a really big round of applause. We've got um, Kobe Bartels. Kobe Bartels is a journalist and a TV host obsessed with all things motorized. He's a lifelong motorcycle tragic, riding, wrenching, and trawling marketplace, oh, particularly when on the toilet. That's good for his next bike. When he's not out riding, Kobe spends his time messing around in trucks, tractors, evacuators, and really any evacuators. <laughs> and really anything vaguely mighty for his show, television show, Mighty Machines. For Kobe, the magic in motorcycles is in the community, and he's here to tell you a story about it. So guys, please welcome to the stage Kobe Bartels. Good day. As I sang you here a lot, it's four wheels move the body, two wheels move the soul. But I've always called bullshit on that, and there's a couple of reasons why. I don't think of motorcycles as magic, and I don't think of them as my religion. I do them because they're fun, and I like riding them. But when I look back across my life, they've taught me a lot of critical lessons, and they're important to me. It all starts for me when I was five. I came out on Christmas morning, and I saw a very poorly wrapped motorcycle, not a PlayStation, a poorly wrapped motorcycle. And it was obvious by the size, the shape, and the fact that my mum at the time was dating a fella who had a farm and liked motorcycles. <laughs> Kiss ass move. He's now been my stepdad for 25 years. <laughs> but I love that thing, and it was the best Christmas I've ever had since, honestly. And for the next year, I rode it every chance I got. I'd race around the house in the backyard, I'd take it to the farm on weekends, and occasionally when I was able to sneak out, I'd race the postie up and down the street. <laughs> Did it twice, got it confiscated both times, and a smack, worth it. <laughs> <laughs> About a year into ownership, I um, it would have been year two, maybe halfway through year two, and a little kid, little daredevil kid I knew, Liam, said, mate, can we take your, your motorbike up to the farm and you can show me how to ride? And I went, yeah, yeah, right, we'll do that. Our parents spoke, they agreed on it, all was good. Started driving to Tagulua, which was where the family farm was, and we Digimon battled the whole way. And I remember that detail because he killed my Digimon. <laughs> Bastard. We get up to the farm and we kick straight off. I pulled the bike out of the shed and I'm showing how to kickstart it. And I felt really cool. And at this point I thought, this is gonna be win me some street cut at school. Like this is this is a cool thing to be showing someone. And I was showing him how to kickstart it. And from then we got straight into it and I'm fanging around this front paddock and I remember it really vividly because it's where I learned to ride a bike. You know, on the front of the bike, stepped out on the back, you know, like it's how people learn, it's how you learn, or it's how you first experience the bike, you know, people do that. Eventually you're riding it by yourself. So I'm fanging around this paddock and every lap I'm getting closer and closer to this orange electric fence. And I've never hit it by, uh, at this point. Last lap, come flying around, end up entangled in this electric fence. And I'm, I'm like ticking away. <laughs> and I'm trying not to piss myself because it, it's like a natural reaction when you're getting electrocuted. <laughs> and I'm trying not to cry because it's also a natural reaction when you're embarrassed as a seven-year-old. And I laid there and thought, fuck, I can see my mate running up to me. He's laughing. Every kid at school is going to hear about this. I'm fucked. But I got up. And we ended up having an awesome weekend. And I learned a couple of things that day. Don't show off on a motorcycle, because <laughs> they don't have empathy, and they'll bite you. And it's only a matter of time. And the other thing is just don't show off in life, or you'll look like a wanker. <laughs> um, the next big lesson came probably 16 years later. I'd had a big hiatus from riding. And that was because you know you hit your teen years, and you go through an emo phase and you, you know, it's not conducive to dirt bikes so you just kind of walk away from it. And I got to my early 20s and something was missing. I didn't, I didn't have it all and I thought, fuck, I need to get my licence. So I got my bike licence, bought a bike and one of my first big trips out, we're hammering over Mount Nebo, or Glorious I think, and we were on 250cc land bikes. We probably weren't going very quick but we thought we were and we were hammering along <laughs> and this car's doing like 15 under. And so we've all started, a group of four of us, we've all started overtaking. And I was the last one. And I'm halfway across, you know, halfway up this car and he's just turned right for no reason, straight into me. And I've gone, fuck, straight over the car, landed pretty well, bike's gone flying. He was trying to get to a little dirt 
pull-off area and it didn't indicate, didn't even see me, didn't hear me because my bike was too little. <laughs> little bikes are dangerous. And um, I lay there and I thought, fuck, I can, see, I can see blood on my visor. I'm bleeding from the head. And so two of my mates have come back, started abusing the driver. Two of my mates have come to me and they're trying to get my helmet off and I'm going... I'm bleeding. And they're going, yeah, I don't think you're bleeding from your head. It's on the outside. <laughs> and I'm like, well, it's, no, it's someone's blood. And so we eventually get my helmet off. No blood. And they're all like, like you know when you see monkeys going through each other's head? <laughs> they're all like, no, no, you're not bleeding from your head. And I was like, all right, sweet. I thought, thought I was off scot-free. Took my glove off. Finger was completely fucking ripped apart. So I was like, all right, that sucks a bit, but it's a finger. It's all sweet. I've coincidentally actually injured the one right next to it on the weekend. <laughs> but I... Um, I sat up and as I was sitting there, I remember thinking, it's fine when you're a kid or a teenager and you eat shit. You get up, you dust yourself off. But as an adult, when you get hit by a car, I don't want to do this anymore. I could have died. I'm going to get my ute, take the bike home, sell it, and I'll move on. I'll play tennis, <laughs> golf, or something like that. Something relatively safe, but still kind of fun. Um, one of my mates that was there saw that I was distressed and he came up. His name is Pete and he said, mate, if you don't get back on the bike, you never will. If you don't get back on now, you probably won't get back on. And I said, can I just go to the doctor first? And he went, no. <laughs> and so he had some red electrical tape in his bike bag and he went, well, put your finger back together. We'll jam a glove on and honestly, just even if you just ride home, just get back on the bike. So I went, all right. I was impressionable. So I went, yeah, righto. Take my finger up and... Actually, when I went to the doctor later that day, he said electrical tape's really good because it peels straight off. It's, it's, it's a good way to hold a finger together. But I got back on and I ended up, seriously, and I ended up having one of the best days of riding that I've ever had. And, um, you know, I think it was because I got back on the bike and I didn't want to. I knew I should, but I got back on and I was proud of that. And after that day of riding, I realised I learned something important that day and that was if you love it and it brings you joy... You know, get back on the proverbial bike. Don't just walk away from it because it hurt you. And in life, that's come into play so many times. Like, you know, bosses being a massive dickhead, you, you know, you, you want to quit, but you go, no, I love the job. Stick with it. Get back on the bike. Keep going. It's worth it. You know, relationship, you, it's easier to walk away sometimes than putting in the work. Get back on, you know, do it properly, you know, stick with it. And that lesson was really important to me and it's come into you know, my mind so many times during difficult positions in my life where I've been knocked down and I've gone, am I ready to walk away from this or do I wanna, do I wanna stick with it a bit longer? The last lesson is more of sort of a, an awakening than a lesson. Um, and it's about community and it's something that a lot of the people in this room probably, you know, the bike people probably really get and everyone else probably gets as well. Um, you know, the togetherness that I think uh, bikes have offered for me is really important. And I'd, I'd moved to Sydney a few years ago and I didn't know anyone. So I was like, seriously, got to this. I was Googling, like, how do you make friends in a new city? What do you do? Pretty fucking dire. <laughs> and I think one of the things was like, lean into a hobby, like do a group sport. And I, I didn't want to do a group sport. So I went, all right, I'll lean into motorbikes. So I went down to Rising Sun in Newtown, which is like a shared workshop space slash cafe slash bar. I got talking to one of the guys that runs at Faden and he went, come on a ride, you know, come on a ride, meet all the guys. Went on a ride and these people were in the process of forming a not-for-profit called Lost Motos, which is a, it's a mental, mental health awareness group, you know, centred around motorcycles and breaking down stigmas around, you know, tough, only tough people ride motorcycles and, you know, you can't talk about stuff, you know. So we'd go on these rides and go on a 30-minute ride but you'd spend two hours afterwards all sort of connecting and offering support, maybe leaning on someone if you weren't having the best time. And I learned about community then, and I think, you know, without motorcycles, I probably wouldn't have learned about community in that kind of a way. I wasn't open to it. Um, so I came, came away from that, and I'd learned that, you know, probably the rawness, the vulnerability, the danger in motorcycles does bond us, and I, I think a lot of people that I know and that I ride with can relate to that. It brings you together because there's a shared responsibility when you're on a ride, you know, you finish up and you're there for each other. Um, and so that was, that, was the, that was the big lesson for me, is, is the sense of community. Um, so while I said, you know, I don't think motorcycles move your soul, I think the people do. Uh, the people that ride are everything. Um, but if I can give any advice, it's don't learn all your lessons falling off <laughs> like I did. <laughs> There's an easier way.
Thanks, guys. Kobe Bartell, you guys. Keep going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. <laughs> As I listen to uh, Kobe's story, I realize that there is a possibility that you guys think that I have a problem with my dad. <laughs> and I do, but... The thing is, it's not the motorcycle. And I see exactly what you were saying, Kobe. I see that in my dad. He absolutely loves the community that he's a part of. He loves riding from place to place and chatting. I mean, he also loves drinking a lot. But the chatting, I know he loves. And I think that the real reason why it gets my goat that he has chosen motorcycles as his thing is because when I was 16, I had a boy who had this motorcycle and he had like, it was the 90s, he had this hair, right? It was like the long and it was red and it was like, and he had a leather jacket and he had a Harley. And I was obsessed with going on this bike in like a long skirt and thinking that was super cool, right? To the point where I was only in grade 11. And so what I would do, and he's, he was just a friend, right? Like he was not inappropriate, he was just a friend, but I thought he was so cool that I set up this whole thing where I would get him to come and pick me up from school. And I had this vision, right? Where like the bell would ring and I would run out of the school. I would throw my bag to the ground. I'd hop on the Harley and off we go into the sunset. Except he was 45 minutes late and there was nobody at school. And it was, the, it was a disappointment, and uh, it was after this point that I was telling my dad, I was telling him all about how I loved this motorcycle, I loved riding, I thought it was so cool, you know, the wind in your face, and that was the moment my dad said, I'm going to get a motorcycle, and I was like, this is not the way it should go. I'm supposed to rebel, you know, but then he quit his job, so it was fine. Um... <laughs> We have two more speakers for you guys tonight, and they are excellent. Um, I am in awe of this next speaker. Um, Dina Lynch is our next speaker, and I was just informed that she dropped an album this week uh, that Amazon has featured. <laughs> so, yeah, huge round of applause. Uh, Jaguar Jones and its adjacent pro projects, the Narrative Illustration Project, Spectator Jones, and the Gender Subverting Photography Project, Dusky Jones. Imagine needing this many like names for all the stuff that you are so good at. It's incredible. Um, and the, okay, our powerful ways in which our next speaker, Dina Lynch, processes her most intimate vulnerabilities while empowering others to do the same. Dina's meticulously realized work has earned her the partnerships with brands like like Reebok, BMW, OB, and Stuzzy, and an abundance of press praising her commitment to confronting social ills and breaking stigmas. In her story tonight, Dina will be talking about the discrimination she faces as a young Asian woman who rides motorcycles with the swig of humor and sass we all know her for. So I want you guys to give the biggest, warmest welcome. Please welcome to the stage, Dina Lynch. I'm actually shitting my pants, I'm so scared, um, because this was booked like three months ago and I didn't realise at the time that I'd be dropping an album in the same week and so I'm tired and you're talking to a shell of a human today. So, and then I feel really bummed being going forth because Jules, you offered me, you know, an opportunity to rock, paper, scissors for the first position and I wish I laid down and told you to like take my spot because all of you guys have been so amazing and I hate you all, thank you. <laughs> um, but one of the things I love the most about riding motorcycles is that it feels like I'm giving myself a moment out of my crazy, chaotic life. It's another form of meditation for me where I get to be present with my mind, my body, and my bike. It's just me, my bike, and the open road. I think most motorcycle riders will say the same thing because things like anxiety, sadness, stress get smaller, and then things like race, gender, and age cease to matter. 
And the pleasure of being on the open road is it's just me and the beautifully crafted machine, and that is freedom. Freedom that lasts until I get off my bike and take off my helmet. Um, I grew up with my Taiwanese mother, and I don't know if anyone knows what Asian mothers are like, but daughters and motorcycles, no. <laughs> Huge no. So she told me, because she knew I always wanted to get into motorcycles, she told me if I was going to buy a bike, she would absolutely kill me. So you're not talking to me today, she's already killed me. Um, I bought my first bike seven years ago, um, and the ghost that you're talking to today bought a Yamaha 1990s. Seven SRV 250. Um, I've since upgraded to a Ducati Scrambler Classic and a 1984 Suzuki TS185 for off-road and all sorts of cheeky shenanigans. Um, I've attended motorcycle events such as Dust Hustle, Classic Dirt, Throttle Roll and Aftershock and I was part of the Sailor Jerry Jerry Can Ride documentary that saw us riding for two weeks from Melbourne to Brisbane, through all the gorgeous snowy mountains, outbacks, towns and countrysides that Australia has to offer. I've met so many incredible people through riding. And although the pleasure of the uh, riding on the open road is gender, age and race neutral, I have found that most people assume that I'm either a man, <laughs> associated with a man, or have absolutely no idea what I'm doing, which was true in the beginning. What am I gonna say next? Oh yes, yeah, so I'll tell you a story. Um, uh, you know, these interactions, although most of the time uh, is frustrating, it's also sometimes really hilarious and it brings out my sassy side and I feel like that's the side you're gonna meet tonight. So this one time I was riding home from South Bank in the left lane, so just close to here, and an Uber driver in the right lane, kind of similar to your story, Kobe, uh, decided to turn left from the right lane at the very last minute without shoulder checking. So rammed me, T-boned me into a fence. And he panicked, quickly pulled out, didn't even offer me a towel, and drove away. Yeah, and so this witness comes running towards me and was like, are you okay? And I was like, look after my bike. And I got up with all the adrenaline pumping through my body and I chased after the Uber driver. <laughs> <laughs> so here I was feeling like I was a bloody transformer and at the time could not feel a shred of pain in my body and I am really not telling this story to recommend you to do the same thing. But at the time I was gunning for my shred of justice, okay. And so he was stopped at a red light, luckily. And when he saw me through his window, his face was in so much shock. And at the time I was chuffed, but it's probably because I was still wearing my helmet. And I forgot all my manners and all my pleasantries. And I opened that door without knocking, unclicked his seatbelt, pulled him out, saw his wallet on the side door, grabbed his wallet, flipped it open, looked at his ID and started demanding for his insurance details. <laughs> All of that, and his reaction to me was, oh, thank fuck, I thought you were a man. Oh, you're just a girl, oh. And I don't know what's worse, the fact that he assumed I was a man or that he was okay with leaving any human on the side of the road. Anyway, I definitely think it's the latter, but that's not my point of the story today. He paid for my damages. That's the point of my story today. No, it wasn't. Um, and then, afterwards, he had the balls to ask me out on a date. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I accepted. No, of course I accepted. No. <laughs> no, I actually strongly declined. I strongly declined and said to him, how on earth are we ever going to explain to our family and friends that we romantically met after you negligently did a hit and run on me? <laughs> And like, maybe I could be wrong, and we could have been the cutest fucking couple in Brisbane, but I'm never going to find out. <laughs> Since then, I've encountered my fair share of ageist, sexist, or racially insensitive remarks. And like, although they are meant with no ill intent, they are microaggressions and ignorances that we do need to be aware of. 
Today, though, feel free to both. Oh, sorry. Today, though, feel free to both learn and laugh. So another time, I was getting my bike scrutineered at a flat track race, and I had a loose brake cable. And the scrutineering man asked me, "Do you have a significant other that can help you with that?" To which I replied, "Well, I wish I had replied. Let's pretend I replied like that." To which I wish I had replied. I sure do. Let me grab one of my many wives over here to help me with that. <laughs> or maybe I wish I had asked, um, yeah, sure. Do you also have a significant other that can help me make a sandwich to eat while I tighten up that loose brake cable? <laughs> I'm totally just kidding. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Um, or another time at a classic bike race meetup, a racer dude came up to me and said, more people like you should come to these events. Good on you for turning up. I had no idea what he meant. I didn't know what differentiated me from other people, so I asked him. And I'd been to that event many, many times before. So I asked him, what do you mean more people like me? To which he replied, yeah, you know, young, Asian, women. It was all three. I felt like it was all three in three words, like pew, pew, pew. Oh, what else is there? Is there? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And then there's always the ever lingering. So, did your dad get you into riding bikes? Yeah? Or was it your uh, boyfriend that got your passion for bikes fired up? Or when I answer that I now ride a Ducati Scrambler, I'll cop the assumption oh, you're on one of those Lerno-approved uh, Ducati scramblers that they just re released in those cute colours, yeah? No, 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 no. Actually, my engine is way bigger than yours. Not that size ever mattered, right? <laughs> uh. <sighs> Historically, machines like motorcycles belong to men. And advertisements and pop culture aimed at men, uh, may aim, uh, surrounding motorcycles have always been aimed at men. And when we do see women in advertisements and pop culture, they are normally sexy, scantily clad, and draped over the bike rather than riding it. And while there is nothing wrong with this, and you might say that it is liberating, or on the other side of things, you might say that it is another form of objectification, whatever side you sit on, I can say with 100% certainty that most women motorcycle riders would choose not to wear short shorts and a string bikini when riding a motorcycle on the open road. It just seems extremely uncomfortable. And not only that, it's also extremely dangerous. And I prefer to keep my skin attached to my body, especially if I'm going to get clipped by another Uber driver who could potentially be my future husband. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think we need to be changing the conversations around women riding bikes. Because until we see more women, uh, more images of women riding bikes, until we see advertisements and products around for women, not just as passengers and decorations, but as drivers, riders, uh, riders, sorry, riders, until we foster environments with less macho testosterone heat so that women feel welcomed and need to not prove themselves until we have more motorcycle women motorcycle clubs so glad to learn one tonight dykes on bikes and programs until we reduce the microaggressions and ignorant remarks that hurts and isolates we women motorcycle riders will have to forever explain that yes this is my bike and not my significant others. And yes, would you believe it? I rode it here all by myself. <laughs> it's not motorcycles that engender 
age or specify your race. It's people that do. So whether you're an Anne Hathaway in a tight Kevlar cat suit, racing away like the road queen you are, or you're a grease monkey that customizes every little thing on your bike, tightening up loose brake cables across the lands, or you just want a more convenient, more exciting way to get to work, or you're like me, who finds motorcycles exciting, liberating, calming, and most importantly, economically efficient. <laughs> Don't let anybody hold you back. That goes for everyone. Let's just have some fun. Dina Lynch, you guys, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. Everybody, we have one more speaker, and I'm not even going to waste any more time. I'm just going to introduce her. Uh, we've got uh, Navi Karan, is an all-around goddess in the form of a multi-gender trans woman, badass entrepreneur, community educator, organizer, writer, and choreographer from India, based in Mijan, Brisbane. Her work aims to create platforms for storytelling that is accessible and safe for identities of various intersections and communities. Named as one of the 30 under 30 LGBTIQ plus leaders in Australia by Out for Australia, Navi Karan is a theater producer and performer, having starred in The Neighborhood by La Boite Theater Company, amazing. Future Ancestors by Metro Arts and Tales from the Colony by the Skin Deep Collective. You can find her tracks on Spotify and buy her chai at Romantic? Uh, which she's the founder of. Navi Karan's pronouns are she, they, and in this story, she brings it all back to the beginning. Please welcome to the stage, Navi Karan. Please, woo! Yeah. Good evening. I had no idea why I'm going last. <laughs> um, I want to start by acknowledging that we're meeting on stolen traditional land that belongs to their sovereign honors, the Jagara and Turbal people. And I would like to pay my respects to their ancestors, past, present, and emerging. I also want to pay my respects and alliances to those here who are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and the surrounding islands and regions. And thank you for being here. Aboriginal sovereignty was never ceded. It always was and always will be Aboriginal land. My name is Navi Karan. This poem doesn't have a name, but welcome. Okay. Have I ever told you I want to be an entire city to you. Bring you dreams and turquoise aspirations freshly conspired on concrete and billboards. I want to be the magical magnolia of urban legends whispered through share houses and graveyards. The heady rows of the gossips Trespassed in salons and change rooms, I want to be the tangerine thrill of window shopping and shoplifting and ridiculing the market value of inner city properties. I want to be the fascination of watching strangers taking long walks with their hands full of groceries because they've spent all their bus money on ice cream or vegan cheese <laughs> or just plain old poverty. And you know you've been there. I want to be the comfort chestnut of early morning cafes on cozy chairs and coffee. I want to be the lilac piece of picnics and holding hands on park benches and paperback poetry. I want to be the bedazzled bronze hitting your cheekbones just so that I can capture the nonchalant amber of your smile. I want to be the toil of the entire working class bustling in underground trains. I want to be the hustlers 
realizing the reality of their bodies tearing apart from a disease named capitalism. I want to be the crimson chaos of late night drunken disasters. I want to be the flamingo pink and the rowdy raspberries of parties so gay that if they ever painted a picture of us, all they would remember was the liberation. I want to be an entire cityscape to you of silver and moonshine, of lavender silences by the river where I kiss your face just to be reminded that I want to be an entire home to you. Because right now, home feels like a forever distance between reality and desire that if we were to be privileged to happiness, that would only mean remaining and satisfied in the here and now and never of what it could be. Freedom. <laughs> Freedom. Most days I realize how mistakenly safe I feel within my chaos that I so consistently repeat my cycles of turmeric trauma that I am now too fast for autonomy, like the way I ride motorbikes on highways, forgetting to remember that I could belong somewhere, or the way that I anguish in the lucid ochre mysteries of my avoidance and desire, only to find myself painted in what the corporate world calls self-care and the Catholic Church calls sin. And I don't know about you, but all I want to continue being is this vision to you, the most warmest purple I have ever seen, you, the most ridiculous of the reds of the poems I've never written, you, a daydream I could never decide on, you are the gold existing in the multiplicities of the Venn diagrams that I could neither ever grasp nor ever be worthy of. And so for you, I will be an entire map so that if you are ever lost, I want to be the streets tattooed that will bring you home. So come, here I am by the door. I will be the peach light porch of your welcome, the soft glow pearl of straw mats and mustard frying on the pan, and Kishore Kumar on the radio, and Adrak Wali Chai come home. I want to be the babble of children and their brown curiosities, the euphoria of waking up next to us in bed two hours past midnight, just to acknowledge the marigold flame of the moon and my heart next to you come home. I want to be an entire concert to you, the collective harmonies of an entire stadium, singing and chanting the room into a spell holier than God come home. I want to be the greenest of the blues you'll ever sway your hips to, the yellowest of the laughters you'll ever find, the most magenta of your heart racing next to mine so that on every Valentine you are the knock on my door delivering roses for no reason but the gesture. I am so scared of writing love poems because there's always more oppression to address and feels like there's not enough space for my heart. I am so afraid of writing love poems that here I am building this for you from the start just so I can hide in your glory and I will never know what to call this poem because I can never stop finding ways to adore you and so for now I will just call this by the word of your name. It's insane. Have I ever told you? If we ever found ourselves in the comfort chestnut of early morning cafes and cozy chairs and coffee, that I would so readily mix your emerald joy with my sapphire desire to ground us in your heaven. And have you ever wondered 
the colors we could manifest if this was our foundation. Thank you very much. Thank you.